Obviously, we're going to be talking about the financial outlook for Europe. Uh, please join me on stage, uh, Elizabeth McCall, Gikas Harduvelis, and Nicolas Veron. Thank you. Joan, I've got your phone. I'm going to go through it and check all your contacts. That's all right. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, quite a change of topic. Um, the financial outlook for Europe, I mean, the outlook for Europe is a, is a tough question. The financial outlook for Europe uh, is part of that. Uh, we face an extraordinarily uh, disrupted financial sector at the moment uh, with technology, with geopolitics, uh, with the shifting shape of uh, Europe's own uh, governance structures. So let me pass straight across to Elizabeth McCall, who's a member and of the supervisory board at the European Central Bank. Give us your thoughts, please. Thank you. First of all, it's an honor to be here and um, really a pleasure to be here in Greece. Um, it's an optimistic time for Greece and it is also um, the case that I'm sitting here talking with you today and able to say that um, the banking sector in general is in resilient, steady shape. And that's uh, quite a statement after what we've been through. Um, the focus of the last four and a half years while I've been at the European Central Bank sitting on the supervisory board has been really um, a focus on making sure that the banks can remain resilient in the face of incredible challenges. The challenges have been the pandemic, geopolitical challenges stemming from the North with uh, the, the Russian aggression in the, in the Ukraine with respect to the concerns in the Middle East and the potential for conflagration there. Um, other geopolitical risks, um, you know, we're focused on China, Taiwan, um, Iran, other areas. I mean, these are novel risks that the banks have to manage in the face of continuing to be resilient. Um, we're in an environment where low for long uh, went for quite long and rising interest rate environment presented particular challenges to the resiliency of the banks. Um, you know, what, what is the mismatch potentially in terms of the asset liability management? Um, what's happening with respect to underlying potential weaknesses in loans that are sitting on the balance sheet of the, book, of the banks? Um, it's the case that I can say um, hand on heart that this resiliency has been something um, quite remarkable and creating confidence in the banking system with the start of the SSM is um, something that we've really, really benefited from. But it's not the case that as I sit here now that I'm sanguine um, or complacent about where things can be going. And we continue to be very focused on making sure that the banks can withstand the continuing challenges. Um, we survived also last March without a very significant blip and these are, you know, these were emanating from markets that you wouldn't have expected them to come from with the U.S. with Silicon Valley Bank, uh, First Republic Signature Bank, Credit Suisse, Switzerland, and of course the gilt market issues. Um, in the U.K., our banks continued to remain resilient. Um, they're well capitalized, the liquidity ratios are, are strong, but as we look forward, we want to make sure that the novel risks are being taken on board in a very sophisticated way, that climate and um, technology and digitalization plans are being taken on board in a sophisticated way, that institutions are focused on their future profitability and making sure that they have um, correctly taken on board adverse scenarios with respect to the headroom that they have for capital. So bottom line, um, the state of the banking sector is resilient and our focus going forward is on maintaining that resiliency in the context of you know challenging quite challenging times that overall sounds uh, fairly positive particularly in the context of what we've been through as you mentioned and and what we're actually going through we try not to think about it too much but you know there's a lot of uncertainty out there we'll come back to you uh, Elizabeth for more on the uh, European perspective but let's turn to Greece uh, bring this a bit more local. Gikas Harudovelis, you're the chairman of the board of directors of the National Bank of Greece and the chairman of the Hellenic Bank Association. 
You're also a professor of finance and economics and at the University of Piraeus here in Greece. So very well qualified to give us your thoughts in five minutes. Uh, th thank you, Alastair. Uh, I'm sitting here next to our regulator who I feel like we're almost partners because they work very closely with us. And indeed, the Greek banks are thankful to, to them because they gave us the time to adjust. We went through a major crisis 10 years ago. Uh, you know, banks were destroyed, they were recapitalized many times, and we finally made it. And now we have turned the page. And I'll uh, just quote you some numbers to substantiate that. Uh, eight, about eight years ago, half of our loan portfolio was non-performing. That was back in 2006. And now at the end of December, uh, only about 6, 6.6% 6 of that is non-performing. It's going down fast. Of course, the European average is about 1.8%, so there's more work to do, but we're working on that, and, and, uh, and we think we'll succeed. Uh, the banks are well capitalized. Elizabeth mentioned uh, capital. Of course, it's the number one item that uh, SSM looks at. The uh, capital ratio, the, the core equity tier one for Greek banks, the average was 15.5%, very close to the European average, which, which was 15.7% in, in, in December. And, and Greek banks also have plenty of liquidity. They satisfy all the requirements of the regulators. Essentially, the loan to deposit ratio back in December was like 67%. There's a lot of money out there to be lent. So we're looking for good businesses to lend money to. And, and I, 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 something that I'd like to stress is uh, the stress test of, the, of, of SSM, of the 2023 stress test. The Greek banks did extremely well, exceptionally well. They, they had the uh, 5th, the 12th, the 13th, and the 19th pos position among 109 European systemic banks. This, uh, this is something to actually be proud about uh, coming through after a crisis. And, uh, finally, I, I should say that three of the four systemic banks already have investment grade, uh, and uh, in the last two years, banks finally are profitable. Uh, the, uh, and this year, uh, for the first time after 16 years, we are going to distribute dividends. This is a signal to the market that we're coming back, normality is back with the Greek banking system. So. Um, the question is, what about next? Uh, some people say, okay, you're, you're, you're profitable because interest rates went up, so it's a cushy time. What about uh, next year when rates are gonna come down? Are you gonna lose profitability? And uh, uh, I'd say uh, what will make us uh, sustain the profitability is the fact that uh, lending it keeps expanding. Uh, and that's driven by economic growth. And as you know, a country that does well uh, economically, its banks do well as well. And the markets have, uh, have realized that, by the way. In the last year, uh, the Greek systemic banks, their price to book values have gone up, for some of them, to 0.9, which is very close to where, where Europe is. So things are well, and I think the market thinks, and everybody thinks that the good times is not a temporary phenomenon, it's, it's, they're going to last. Are there risks out there? Of course there are risks. Uh, you mentioned uh, Elizabeth digitalization. This is something that concerns us. Uh, the Greek banks are trying, to, uh, are, are trying to transform themselves. They are digitalizing fast. And the question is, in, this is, this is a common to all European banks, are they digitalizing fast enough relative to what uh, the demand is out there? And because they have uh, competitors. Not so much the fintechs, but the big techs, okay? That's, uh, so they need to, to work hard. Um, but the biggest risk is economic growth in Europe, I think. And, 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 and the economic growth can suffer from the political rivalry of the superpowers and the conflicts in our region. We know this very well. Uh, Europe particularly can suffer because it cannot compete as easily with the superpowers because it doesn't have, have its own industrial policy. It cannot yet act as one entity. It still needs consensus, it takes time, it's, it's very hard to, to compete. And then there's the green transition where Europe has taken the lead and it's costly. 
Uh, in general, uh, growth is, is, is something we have to worry about. When it comes to digitalization, it's up to the banks, and there they can control the risks a lot better. Uh, Nicholas, um, senior fellow at Bruegel and at the Peterson Institute for International Economics in Washington. I don't think you're Washington-based. I don't know. You are Washington-based? Okay, excellent. Well, that, that gives me permission to ask you quite a few questions later on. Um, your thoughts, please. I and mean, we've, we've heard uh, the European perspective here and, and uh, a, a view from in Greece. What, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I will uh, just uh, emphasize what has already been said, so I will try to do it succinctly. Uh, the single supervisory mechanism, or European banking supervision, as the ECB calls it, is a spectacular success of European Union policy. Uh, when you think of the situation we were in 10 years ago, a bit before this uh, came into force, you remember the asset quality review of the banks. I'm not even mentioning the situation of Greece at that point. Uh, we've gone such a long way, and I think it's not just correlations. There is an element of causation here. Uh, the uh, pooling of banking supervision at the European Central Bank, at the ECB, with the work that has been done by Elizabeth and her colleagues, uh, the successive leaders of the uh, SSM, Daniel Nui, Andrea Enria, currently Claudia Buch. I think this is a success story that deserves to be celebrated more than we usually do, uh, because it has really gone according to plan. The plan was to uh, bring the European banking sector, which was in a state of extraordinary weakness in the Eurozone crisis, actually had caused the Eurozone crisis to a large extent, uh, not in Greece, but in other member states, uh, to bring that sector back to uh, safety and soundness. And I think uh, the ECB and the European Union more broadly can claim mission accomplished on that. Now, of course, as, as Elizabeth correctly said, this should not be a cause for complacency because the risks of tomorrow will be different of the risks, uh, from the risks of yesterday. But I think a, a, a nanosecond of pause and celebration for the 10-year anniversary of European banking supervision uh, is uh, in order. I will also say that banking union is a broader project than European banking supervision. And banking union is this idea that the entire framework for banking sector policy would be at the European level, which in turn would allow the banking sector to be a European banking sector and not an addition of national banking sectors uh, in the participating member states. We're not yet there. Uh, European banking supervision is a piece of that, but it's not sufficient to trigger the complete integration of the banking sector at European scale. And for that, of course, we need a, a framework for crisis intervention, including deposit insurance, but not only deposit insurance, that would be integrated and consistent at the EU level. That has been blocked by special interests in the different member states, both from the public and from the private sector. It is a shame, frankly, that there hasn't been more progress because all the political leaders uh, recognize that the banking union and also a capital markets union is in their collective interest, but when it comes to implementation, they always find obstacles from uh, special interest. So I want to emphasize both the success of the crisis prevention piece, European banking supervision, and the unfinished business of banking union uh, that, frankly, I think we should have more of a sense of urgency right now. Having said that, and I will end on that note, I think it's exaggerated to say there can be no uh, integration of the banking sector in the current circumstances without further legislation to complete the banking union. And actually, if uh, you look at it from here in essence, we see that the European banking sector or the regional banking sector is investable again. We have Eurobank buying Hellenic Bank in Cyprus. That's from the perspective of Cyprus, certainly, and also from this part of Europe, a major cross-border banking acquisition that was just confirmed a few days ago. Uh, we also have the investment of Unicredit in Alpha Bank, which shows that from the perspective of a, 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 a European bank, major European banks, the Greek banking sector is investable again. Uh, so that's a lot of news. Uh, for, uh, and, and why not, we could also see uh, uh, Greek banks expanding again, the way they did uh, on a different basis uh, in the 90s and, and 2000s. So I think there are reasons for optimism uh, on the European banking sector. Of course, it requires policy stability 
and also policy initiative, as I suggested, for the completion of the banking union. But when you compare to where we are 10 years ago, um, the element of a policy success story is undeniable. Well, I sense a great deal of harmony uh, on our panel. And among bankers, that's always a very reassuring thing to see. Um, we will come back to look at some of those uh, risks that we've mentioned, because I think it's important, while we're all congratulating ourselves about how well we've done over the last 10 years, uh, to acknowledge that these things come at us fast and we don't always see them. So we should have a little word or two about that. But before we do, um, you mentioned prospects for banking union, uh, Nicolas. Banking union and perhaps even more importantly, capital market union, which has come up, uh, I don't know if you've been around today, but it's come up today, it's come up yesterday as an important uh, aspect of the business environment for investors here in Greece. What are the prospects for union on both of those two fronts, on the, on the banking side and on the capital market side, Elizabeth? Well, may, may I first start with saying that um, I see the completion of the banking union and the creation of, of a capital markets union as absolute necessities, um, largely for some of the reasons I outlined in the beginning, that you know, we have made it through these first 10 years of the SSM. And Nicola, you're absolutely right. We should um, give congratulations for that. And I give the congratulations to my predecessors completely um, and all of the policymakers that envisioned a banking union and what it could do for the resilience of the banking sector in Europe. Um, this is something that is, it's absolutely, it's spectacular to use your word, but it's absolutely extraordinary. And as the first American on the board of the SSM, I hope it is first, um, it's with incredible awe that I walked into that boardroom and saw the sophistication with which confidence in the banking sector, recapitalization of the banking sector was taking place. But the job's not done. And we have uh, a moment now. I mean, I, I'm always, um, uh, I have this uh, sensation of needing to run incredibly fast in the environment in which we're living in, largely because of uh, the, 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 the challenges that we're facing and the rate of change with which these challenges are coming across to us, the technological advances, the shifts in the demographics, the challenges of, of climate risk, environmental risk. Um, these are things that are not minor. The shift in the banking sector itself with the um, ent new entrants, the big techs, the fintechs, the risks that are associated there coming from the geopolitical arena also with respect to cyber. I mean, this is not a calm, moment that we are living in. So it means that um, as the policymakers and the, um, the supervisors and the government officials and the bankers before us did, vision has to be brought and execution has to be brought to engage and to deliver the tools that are necessary to help the marketplace manage those risks. So what does that mean exactly? It means that without having a single safety net, a deposit system, while we are in the days after the success of some very minor cross-border activity taking place to create some consolidation and diversify risk, um, they are very minor and they're not going to continue apace without um, a, an EDIS system, a, a deposit scheme that covers the, the breadth of Europe. Um, this, is, this is essential to create a singular marketplace where cross-border activity can take place. I'll come back to that in a second. Um, but then the second area of, of real concern is the capital markets arena. We do not have, we do not enjoy the depth and breadth of capital markets that is across the Atlantic from us. Um, now, that comes with risks over there, of course. But we are very good at learning from those risks here. And um, we need depth and breadth of capital markets in order to face the challenges that we have in order to diversify and mitigate the risks that are in front of us. If you take the climate risk um, arena, for example, we are facing an enormous financing need with the transition that has to take place. Now, the only way that that can be delivered is with capital markets tools, depth and breadth of the capital markets that exist in other marketplaces. US, UK, to some degree, Asia, 
are we going to finance our transition activities in other markets, or are we going to be able to take advantage of that financing opportunity and management of that risk on our own here in Europe? Second, capital markets union can serve to reduce risk on the balance sheets of the banks. I always say uh, rather colloquially that when you compare the balance sheets of the US banks to the balance sheets of the European banks, um, the word that comes to mind is that we have very heavy balance sheets here in Europe because we do not have the ability to move assets easily off of the books of the banks. And having the ability to move those assets off of the books of the banks frees up balance sheet to make more financing available, frees up risk. You can transition risk in, a, in a, um, an organized and a timely manner rather than in a rush when there's a problem to, to uh, move assets out very quickly, which causes market dislocations. So there's a need to have um, a European vehicle that can um, act as a, uh, an, a responsible and appropriate significant risk transfer vehicle with appropriate tranches in place to um, diversify the risk that we have. We need this also for financing digitalization across Europe. Um, we are, you know, to my lament, in a situation where there is not a single cloud provider of size in the European market, so we're dependent uh, in, in what I would call a, a risk manner on solely U.S. institutions for delivering that, and that's the way of the future. Okay. Uh, it, it's interesting that you take us to, in that direction, uh, the, the digitalization, because I wanted to come to you, Guy uh You mentioned it, uh, the, uh, the challenge that you're facing with, with digitalization, but also with fintechs. Uh, can you expand on that a little bit? Tell us uh, how, uh, what impact the emergence of fintechs is having in the Greek market, how Greek banks are responding, uh, how you see this shaping over the next uh, few years. Sure. Before I say this, I just realized that today is July 4th, by the way. This is a major day for some of us. And the panelists have experience with the U.S. Today is the... Uh, well, we're voting today in the U.K., so... Oh, you're voting it's our, today. <laughs> potentially our it's Independence different. Day as well. But please go ahead. Okay. The uh, um, I, uh, digitalization is, is, is really a uh, very important uh, the uh, uh, it, it, Greek banks are, are able to digitalize fast because they are mid-sized banks. It's a lot more difficult. Large banks, uh, banks that uh, are across the Atlantic, uh, are, are too cumbersome. They have too many legacy systems. It's difficult for them to really uh, change everything. Uh, on the other hand, on the other side, small banks do not have the money to invest and, and digitalize. So uh, Greek banks, are, they have the size, they have the money. Uh, I think my bank, uh, NBG, started it first some years ago. Now every bank, bank has followed. Uh, and uh, digital transformation is really uh, a business make makeover powered by technology. Uh, it, 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 it really changes everything, not, not only the internal processes, but also the uh, uh, contact with customers end to end. Uh, it, it, it implies a seismic cultural shift uh, all over. And it, uh, its main, main characteristics is uh, it's customer-centric. You think of the customer and what you do with it. It's data-driven. You utilize data. You streamline operations. You look at all other systems that were done manually and try to digitalize them. Uh, you make sure your people are with you. And they understand the, the culture is with you. And you change everything end-to-end. So banks started it. I don't think the, uh, the fintechs necessarily in Greece are, are considered as competitors. They're like collaborators. In fact, uh, a lot of banks are, are collaborating with them. Uh, when it comes to fintechs, Greece is behind, Europe in general is behind the US. And uh, to really have a successful fintech, you need, there are some requirements. You need flexible regulation, which you do have in the US. There, the OCC or the uh, SEC, they support uh, the, the fintechs. Here in, in Europe, you have a fragmented regulatory system, uh, country by country. So uh, there, the US is better. You, you need access to capital, and you have venture capital is big in the US, 
It's much, much smaller in Europe. You need public markets. Sometimes you go to IPOs and they are in the US. You need a talent pool and everybody wants to go and work in Silicon Valley or Boston or New York. The, the market is in the US. You need an innovation culture and, uh, and it's with the Americans. They are risk takers. Uh, they have supportive ecosystems. Uh, you need also consumers who are tech savvy. And I think Americans are a little bit more tech savvy than Europeans. Uh, and uh, you need financial inclusion. I think there's more effort there in the US to do it. And finally, you need a large market. And by definition, the US is a much larger market. Right. Uh, now in Europe, some countries are doing better. Uh, the UK and, Ho and Netherlands are leading when it comes to European fintechs, and they are followed by Germany, uh, the Nordics, and the Baltics. And uh, uh, the Europeans in general uh, placed emphasis on, on, cons on protection, data protection, and that's okay. how they moved. And uh, uh, they, uh, they, so, so, uh, so they made emphasis on PSD2, et etc. et cetera. The, uh, when it comes to Greece, uh, I should, should say this and finish, uh, we need to have a 10-year horizon. That's what, that's, how the other, that's what the other countries did. Right. And we have to start with education, the digital skills of the population. Then we have to, about, to worry about technological hubs. There is one in Thessaloniki being created now, and that's it. It hasn't started yet. Uh, we need to worry about financial incentives, and we need to worry about investing. And investments okay. well, mainly in the US. Well, you've come up with quite a, uh, a compelling checklist it's not a yes. short checklist, but that will keep the, uh, yes. this government and the ones that come afterwards busy for 10 years. Yes. I hope they're listening. We've done a lot. I mean, this government yeah. really pushed. The government sector did push, but we need to do a lot more. Okay. Well, considering um, that it's the 4th of July, I did want to uh, give uh, Nicholas the last question. Uh, it's an easy question, uh, and you can answer it, I'm sure, in very, very few words. What's the impact on global banking, European banking, and if you like, Greek banking, of the outcome of the American election? So first, I think we're already in a world where you cannot speak about Greek banking or Greek fintech uh, because we're in a much more integrated market than that. So what we will see, what we want to see, is fintechs based in Thessaloniki or elsewhere in Greece serving not the Greek market, but the European market. The same way as Revolut, which is now under direct supervision of the ECB, uh, is serving the Greek market. But more generally to your question, uh, I would go back to the initial point that uh, was made on this panel. We want the banking sector, the financial sector, to be a source of strength and resilience, not of fragility. I think uh, for that, we need uh, the banking union, the capital markets union, because that's what allows us to withstand the shock of, uh, you know, COVID-19, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the energy crisis, without having financial disruption. And we will have more shocks in the future, whatever happens in the U.S. I want to say something about the role of the Greek government in this. Greek has had this extraordinary success that has been celebrated here over the last few days, of going from uh, countries that needed help and assistance from its European partners and international partners to being a country that at this point stands, stands tall on its feet and is able to act as a normal European member state. In the debate about completing the banking union, about completing the uh, capital markets union, we need Greek leadership. At this point, my beloved country of France is going through a period of political turmoil. The German coalition is what we know. We need leadership and initiative to come from other member states than just France and Germany. Greece has to push for good European policies and not just to react to whatever is being cooked up in Brussels. So I'm really you're... making this call for Greek uh, proactive policy initiative. I think it's possible. I think it's in the cards right now. I think you're pushing against an open door there. I think the Greeks are very, very keen to have influence in Europe. Go ahead. May I add something? Very briefly. That... The new government actually has led Europe, like when it came to COVID, you know, in all the inoculation story. They were, they were first. They pushed it. We actually, and it was, we digitalized it. And everybody had a, a, an ID card whether they inoculated or not. And it was the Greeks that did it. And I think the current government is, is pushing ahead. We have to worry about common defense policy. We have to 
uh, worry about immigration. We have many, many issues to worry about in Europe that are common. Okay, great leadership in action, ladies and gentlemen. Well, I'm going to call it a day there, and we're going to move on to our next session, but uh, I want to give you deep thanks, gratitude from me, because you've all been fantastic. So thanks very much.